Uh, in full disclosure, I did receive uh, some small industry support from Ro Ropar Pharmaceuticals while I was uh, on faculty at Arizona. Uh, that trial looking at a commercially available mouth rinse for the prevention and treatment of uh, mucositis uh, is ongoing, and, and I'm hoping to uh, hopefully uh, open it up here as a participating site soon. So the learning objective this afternoon is to learn a brief history of clinical radiation oncology as it pertains to the management of head and neck cancers. Uh, hopefully I can illustrate the recent applications of advancements in physics, radiobiology, linear accelerator, engineering, uh, review some of the major prospective clinical trials that have shaped and formed our current standard of care, and uh, give a brief overview of where the field is going in general with regards to current clinical trials, um, as well as my own thoughts for where the future might lie. So again, I'll uh, review the sort of the evolution of radiation, primarily over the last um, five decades or so, highlight some of the engineering feats that have allowed us to really conform our treatments, talk about a combined modality treatment, which has been sort of the, the primary way we treat advanced head and neck cancers, discuss treatment tolerability and our efforts to continue to decrease toxicity associated with treatment, and then touch a, a little bit upon, upon um, HPV-related uh, head and neck cancer, which is, which is rising and is, and is largely thought as a, a true epidemic now, and again, uh, discuss a little bit about the future. So these are some milestones in the radiation sciences dating back nearly 150 years ago. Uh, those asterisks are uh, discoveries that have been awarded the Nobel Prize. But what exactly is radiation? Well, it's a black box. Many of my own colleagues don't know what radiation is or how it's delivered or what is actually occurring. Hopefully this talk will elucidate some of that. But sometimes I'm even confused. What, what, what exactly is occurring? It was uh, initially discovered by uh, Rentgen, a German physicist, who uh, discovered this mysterious um, electromagnetism, which he coined the X-ray because it was not visible to the naked eye. Uh, this was awarded the first ever Nobel Prize in the turn of the 20th century. But as humans are humans, we weaponize this new technology, unfortunately, into an atomic bomb. And uh, the consequence of that is, unfortunately, uh, a tremendous amount of public fear in the, um, about, uh, about radiation and, and, and nuclear energy. Head and neck cancer has traditionally afflicted those who we would probably consider uh, live a hard lifestyle with smoking, heavy smoking and drinking, perhaps affecting those that are more socially, economically disadvantaged. But it has a new face in, in recent years. Anyone from uh, a prestigious movie critic to a prominent actor to a uh, NBA head coach now have publicly come out with their battle with this disease. It's a rare cancer, thankfully enough, uh, representing just a fraction of all cancer diagnoses and deaths within the United States and worldwide. Males are at a higher predilection uh, to develop, uh, developing head and neck cancer. It has been associated with tobacco and alcohol use, however, uh, uh, trends are changing, and I'll discuss that in a moment. As I mentioned, HPV-related disease is on the rise, and a subgroup of oral tongue cancers is also on the rise in non-tobacco users for reasons that are, remain unclear at this time. So where is the head and neck? The head and neck is right behind your face and in your neck. These are the subsites that we've delineated anatomically in a sagittal view. The histologies that can develop in terms of malignancies are, are far-ranging, as described here. But the most common histology when you think of head and neck cancer are known as squamous cell carcinomas, and particularly those that ar arise in, the, in the, mouth, the linings of the mouth and throat. What are the causes of head and neck cancer? As mentioned already, uh, historically, it's been tobacco and alcohol use, but other uh, issues may uh, contribute to the development of this disorder. Chronic trauma and inflammation such as lichen planets or ill-fitting dentures, immunosuppression from uh, transplant medications to uh, underlying bone marrow issues. Uh, betel nuts were commonly used as a psychostimulant in India and Southeast Asia and has been associated with this cancer. Uh, Epstein-Barr virus, which is 
the same virus that causes mono has been associated with nasal pharynx cancer. And in fact, in certain parts of Southeast Asia is the number one uh, cancer to arise. And as I mentioned, uh, HPV is on the rise um, in, in, in patients. So how do patients present? Uh, commonly, they develop pain in and around the site of the tumor growth. It is not uncommon that the patient, sometimes upset, uh, comes into the oncologist's office saying, you know, I've had this for six months. I went to my primary care doctor and they prescribed me, prescribed me antibiotic after antibiotic with no resolution. Uh, common things being common, uh, it is much more likely that they would have an infection versus a cancer. And so I reassure the patient that unfortunately, without um, great screening programs for head and neck cancer at the moment, this is an extremely common presentation. So when the patient arrives to our clinic, uh, we often examine them, uh, which includes a flexible laryngoscope where a, a fiber optic camera is placed through the nasal canal to be able to see structures that are not availably uh, present uh, through the mouth. And there's a range of um, disease um, burden that, that can be found at time of presentation here is a laryngoscope looking down the airway. These are what's known as your vocal cords that make your voice. On the left side here, you can see a small, what's known as a leukoplakic lesion at the mid uh, vocal cord. But unfortunately, many patients present in the locally advanced stage where a large exophytic mass encompasses the airway and in some cases threatens the airway requiring an urgent uh, tracheostomy. Head and neck cancers tend to spread via the lymphatic route. It is not uncommon that they present with large, bulky, what's known as lymphadenopathy, cancer cells that have spread to the lymph nodes within the neck region. And thankfully, very few, but some, uh, will eventually have spread distantly outside the head and neck region, primarily to the lung as exhibited here, as little rounded metastases in the periphery of the lung. So why is the head and neck region so important? Well, whether you realize it or not, whether you thought about it or not, it's essential to our basic physiological function, breathing, speaking, swallowing, and it's the centerpiece for our individual identity, how we interface with the world. And though you might consider your identity in your mind, many other people associate you with your face. Uh, and so rates of depression are extraordinarily high for patients who undergo uh, treatment for head and neck cancer because of often their disfiguring and troubling side effects, as well as the difficulty in treating a lot of these cancers themselves. So head and neck cancer treatment has a goal of local regional control because it tends to be a local regional problem. Uh, therefore, secondary objectives are to spare form and function, preserve quality of life, which was my research interest in my uh, almost decade spent at the University of Arizona, and this requires a multidisciplinary approach. That means a wide range of healthcare providers, including a vast array of supportive services and adjunctive um, providers such as dentists to speech and swallow, audiology, et cetera. Within our department in radiation oncology, we also have a multi multidisciplinary team that we rely upon. The physicians, of course, uh, phys physicists, um, to make sure that the machine uh, acts the way and behaves the way it is planned. Dosimetrists are, are people who assist us in developing the radiation plans. Nurses, of course, and therapists who actually beam on, turn the beam on while the patient is on the treatment table um, are imperative as well. What have been the traditional modes of treatment for head and neck cancer? Well, the same ones that, that are common to all other cancers usually, which include surgery, radiation, and systemic therapy. Um, although all have advanced in their own right, I'll speak about it in a moment. How is the treatment selected for any individual patient? Well, just like other cancers, we rely upon accurate staging per an accepted staging criterion and uh, utilizing the evidence available, which are commonly uh, summarized in guidelines which are publicly accessible, such as the NCCN network. So what is the best combination for each patient? And how do we continue to optimize the therapeutic ratio, which means 
increasing oh, the whatever it's easiest. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Which means increasing the uh, disease control and minimizing the toxicity toxicity associated with that therapy. In the 80s and 90s and, and continuing to this day, there was a push for intensification of treatment as these have been very uh, difficult cancers to treat historically, given the nature of these cancers being associated with smoking. And as you can see, we've had a very modest decline in mortality associated with these cancers during that time period. One of the first studies looking at intensifying treatment was RTOG 7303, which was developed and run in the 1970s and looked at the optimal timing of radiation as we related to surgical resection, which was then considered the standard upfront therapy. As you could see here, post-operative radiation did better than preoperative radiation with regards to control of disease and therefore shaped one standard mode of therapy. But a landmark study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1981, which surveyed about 30 or 35 normal healthy subjects, asking them what they would trade for an organ-preserving mode of treatment for their head and neck cancer um, in order to spare their voice box. And it was an interesting finding that one of five people were willing to trade 20% chance of cure for the opportunity to spare their voice. This led to an incredible, uh, I think, um, uh, remarkable study done uh, with uh, the, the VA uh, medical uh, system. God bless our, our veterans. They're the only ones that would allow to do such a study, I think, uh, whereby patients were randomized by flip of a coin were randomized to either surgery and post-op radiation, which was the standard care at the time, versus chemo followed by radiation and good responders. And you can see the outcomes here that the arms were equivalent. And two-thirds of patients who were randomized to the chemo followed by radiation arm saved their voice box, were alive, and presumably disease-free at five years. Continued randomized trials looked to optimize the uh, combination therapy. So a three-arm randomized trial of radiation alone, the winning arm of the VA trial, chemo followed by radiation, and radiation concurrent at the same time with chemo was done. And the results borne out that the combination arm did the best, therefore establishing that as the standard of care for many local events, laryngeal cancer patients. Surgeons have continued to advance the field in their own right, uh, creating the Da Vinci robot for transoral robotic surgery, uh, CO2 lasers for transoral laser and micros uh, microscopic sur surgical techniques. And medical uh, oncology colleagues as well have continued to push the frontier with targeted biologic agents, as well as, as everyone knows, immunotherapy. But since I'm a radiation oncologist, we're going to talk about the developments of radiation and how it pertains to head and neck cancer. So a few slides on the radiobiologic principles of uh, radiation therapy is the high energy photons that we deliver within the patient is ionizing, mean, meaning it dislodges an electron from an atom, most often water because we are two thirds water. This then creates a hydroxyl free radical, which then very quickly damages the, the DNA of the tumor, uh, leading to chromosomal abnormality and cell death. There are many other principles that um, are affected by, uh, or that affect the effectiveness of radiation therapy, both in normal tissue as well as in tumor, and we often try to take advantage of one over the other. Studies in the lab as well as in patients show that there is a relationship, a dose relationship between the amount of dose given to the effect, both in terms of tumor control as well as toxicity. And this follows what's known as a linear quadratic equation. In that vein, many radiation oncologists in the 90s, again, trying to intensify treatment at the time, we're running clinical trials where we altered the fractionation of radiation. Traditionally, radiation uh, in standard fashion is given 
uh, little dose once a day over many, many weeks, which is many times cumbersome uh, and, and can, can be overbearing for patients to, to consider. Here you can see a graphic example of many of the studies I've done, each hash mark representing a little radiation dose given over a variety of, uh, of time intervals. And these studies, a study of studies, which is known as a meta-analysis, was performed and showed here on the forest plot that accelerated fractionation, or altered fractionation, that is, versus standard fractionation, did, uh, did better, improved, however so modestly, though, the, the, the curability of cancers in the single digits, unfortunately at the expense of more side effects. So how does radiation work? How, what is the clinical workflow uh, when a patient is, is consulted with us? First, it starts with a meeting at the time of consultation where we have uh, a thorough um, discussion about their diagnosis and treatment. This is followed by a CT simulation whereby a thermoplastic mask is overlaid the, over the patient's uh, area of interest, at form, forming a hard immobilization uh, device. They are scanned. These images are then imported into sophisticated software where the physician delineates exactly where he wants the dose of radiation to go, normal tissues and organs at risk that are critical for, for normal functioning, and dose tolerances as set as limits. And powerful computer uh, programming allows for us to um, build a delivery plan, which is then uh, QA'd by our physics team uh, with a, an array of diodes, and these are compared uh, in terms of plan to delivered, and if, if it falls within a certain specification of agreement of 3% or 3 millimeters, the patient then assumes treatment over usually many weeks of treatment. Uh, daily setup is verified by onboard imaging each day of treatment, and the patient is then treated. What have been the improvements in, linear, in the linear accelerators? Um, we originally, in the 60s and 70s, did 2D planning, meaning we treated tumors based on x-rays. Tumors were not visible, but we used bony landmarks as surrogates to plan our radiation. As I showed you in the previous slide, the sophistication has ratcheted up tremendously in, in the preceding, uh, preceding decades. We've also implemented the onboard uh, image guidance. Uh, I'll mention a few slides on particle therapy, as I'm sure some of you have heard this notion of proton therapy and what that affords. And then I'll mention about adaptive radiotherapy, which we will hopefully do here very shortly when we get our MR linear accelerator. So this is a, a depiction of a linear accelerator. It shoots electrons near the speed of light, hits the tungsten, a heavy metal target, creating the photons, which are then shaped by what what are known as multi-leaf collimators, and these are dynamically moving during your treatment. Here's the way we used to do things. We would take an x-ray, we would see the bones, we knew that the tumor was somewhere in this region, we'd give a big margin. This is a very rudimentary, customized cutout for the patient, not a lot of uh, um, personalization, some, but not much. Uh, and Today, what we do is what's known as intensity modulated radiation, where the beam is modulated beamlet to beamlet, and that the, the confluence of all the beam fluences will give you conformal radiation, allowing one to target what tissues one wants to tar target, such as the tumor, but spare, in this case, parotid glands, for example, where we don't want those to go. Here's a nice side-by-side -side depiction of exactly what that is. In the old days, a very homogeneous, you know, planar dose distribution, not much spared. Today, we can target the tumor here, primarily on the left side, sparing the mouth, the spinal cord, and the product lens to the side. Well, with that conformality, every day we better make sure we're set up correctly. So we utilize image guidance, and that's done by a variety of techniques. One way is to use x-rays, orthogonal x-rays, using the bones to make sure that they're in alignment each day. But more preferably, we like to use volumetric, CT-based uh, D 
daily imaging and alignment, which is what is utilized in the vast majority of clinics today. A recent advancement has been optical surface monitoring, whereby infrared cameras in the roofs in the ceiling of the treatment room can monitor the surface of a patient's face in this instance and turn the beam off automatically if a threshold of movement is met. Now, I've, I've tried to do my best to uh, describe how this all works. I think I'll play this video, um, which will il illustrate much better than, than what I've done so far, I'm sure. Uh, additionally, uh, the narrator has a British accent, which always helps. Andy just told me that the video is not showing up. Let me try this other, other screen here. Are you guys able to see the video now? Yeah. Okay, so a few, a few slides on particle therapy, the most common of which is known as protons, but other countries have carbon and other heavy ion therapies available. I just read in the press that 
our first heavy ion accelerator will be built by the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, which is exciting news to hear. But there's some controversy with regards to particle therapy, and that's because the studies that have done limited as such have shown mostly equipoise, meaning equivalency with modern high definition photon therapy, which is what you just saw, versus uh, heavy ion particles. And, and the difference is the particles don't have excess, exit dose because they have mass. I won't go too much into the physics, uh, but there are a few indications where particle therapy does seem to be indicated. Patients who have very resistant tumors like melanoma, those who have tumors within the base of skull, which is in and around critical structures of the cranium, and pediatric patients who will often live and suffer many long-term consequences of their radiation. There's been a, a burgeoning of, of centers that have gone live just in the last five years. If I showed you this equivalent map from 20 years ago, there would have been precisely three proton centers in the country, one Loma Linda in Southern California, two MD Anderson in Houston, and three MGH Harvard in Boston. So what is our current standard of treatment for many of our head and neck cancer patients? That is chemo and radiation. And how did that come to be? Well, again, many randomized trials, large prospective trials done here and across the pond in Europe were performed uh, showing, again, in a study of studies of 93 total clinical trials, that in the forest plot, when you gave concurrent meaning you gave both treatments at the same time, chemo and radiation, that again, you gained a cure, an improvement in cure, curability, however, on average, very modestly so. Unfortunately, again, this comes at the cost of increased side effects. One, uh, some radiation oncologists ask the question, well, what if we alter the radiation and add the chemo? These were subsequently done in some landmark studies that showed proved to be negative, meaning no benefit in disease control, just increase in side effects. How about targeted, these fancy new biologic agents such as cetuximab, which is a, an antibody that targets the EGFR receptor here and blocks further downstream effects of cancer proliferation. This was also studied in a randomized trial where radiation plus or minus cetuximab was given in over 400 head and neck cancer patients, and a 10% survival advantage was discovered in the combination group, leading to its FDA approval based on a single study alone. So much of the slides that I presented thus far have shown you our efforts as a field um, as cancer specialists treating head and neck cancer patients at increasing the therapeutic ratio primarily by driving our effort for controlling the cancer. But another way to widen this window is to decrease the toxicities associated with treatment without a detriment to the control that we've achieved thus far. So what are the toxicities of radiation and chemoradiation for head and neck cancer patients? They're long. This is a list and just not comprehensive probably in, um, at all. These are things we expect the patients to experience to one degree or another. Uh, fortunately, late effects are um, more rare but can occur and can significantly alter a patient's remainder of life. Another fear our patients have is the need for a feeding tube. In the early part of my career, I routinely put these in because many of my patients required this as a supportive measure to get them through the treatment. Thankfully, only a fraction, a small fraction of patients rely on this for the remainder of their life should we cure them of their disease. One of the fear, the, one of the more uh, feared side effects uh, of radiation treatment is skin reaction. You can see here a variety of grades and severity of the skin reaction. Thankfully, most of my patients kind of hover in here due to uh, planning techniques that I utilize, as well as the utilization of high-dose prescription steroid creams during treatment. But really, the limiting toxicity for patients undergoing head and neck treatment is mucositis.
that same reaction you notice on your skin, but on the inside, in the lining of your mouth and throat, prohibiting eating well and just being exhausting on, on the body in terms of the energy expenditure needed to, to um, repair this damage. Mucositis occurs in about 100% of patients undergoing modern radiation to some degree or another. And many agents, natural and synthetic, have been tested to see if this side effect, this dreadful side effect, could be mitigated. Many of these have proven positive, albeit with very modest benefits. Switching gears a bit, let's talk about the HPV oral pharynx epidemic. During the 70s, 80s, 90s, and through today, there's been a dramatic decrease in the amount of head and neck cancers associated with tobacco use. This is illustrated by this graph here, where larynx cancer, primarily associated with smoking, has seen a decrease in incidence over time, paralleling that of public health initiatives that have decreased the usage of tobacco in our country. Unfortunately, what has happened is there's been an offsetting increase in HPV-related cancers, perhaps due to changes in sexual habits uh, in our population over the last half century ultimately resulting in a flat incident rate of overall head and neck cancer patients. But this is not the complete picture because HPV cancer patients do much, much better. So what is HPV? The human papilloma virus, technically a sexually transmitted disease and yes, associated with the stigma, which we have to try tremendously hard to combat. The, this virus is one of the most uh, one of the most virulent viruses known to man. The lifetime prevalence currently in the industrial, industrialized world is very, very high. Thankfully, most of us clear it and never knew we were exposed to it. But the strain most common to not only head and neck HPV cancer, but also cervical, anal, and other pelvic HPV-related cancers is 16. But we have a vaccine. And the thought is if we can get our young children uh, prior to uh, um, sexual activity vaccinated, uh, perhaps these cancers can be eradicated in 30 to 40 years, which is the latency period for developing this cancer after uh, being infected with the virus. This will prove a challenge in the modern anti-vaccination world, unfortunately. How does HPV induce cancer? Well, it creates what's known as oncoproteins within your body, which block cell cycle checkpoints, which are normally active to get rid of mutated cells. But as I alluded to just a few moments ago, HPV has tremendous impact on your prognosis. Here is what's known as a recursive, recursive partitioning analysis, which shows three variables which impact your outcome with the same treatment. The first is whether you have HPV-related disease or not. The second is how heavily you smoked. And the third is the stage or the bulkiness of your cancer. And as you can see here, the prognosis is dramatically different between patients who come with low-volume, non-smoking HPV-related disease where the cure rates approach the 90s versus smoking-related, non-HPV, bulky cancers, which have dismal prognoses, despite our best efforts to cure them. Another graph showing just that. HPV-related disease, unfortunately, on the rise in terms of incidence, but prognosis on the rise as well. Flatlined, essentially, for non-HPV-related cancers. We have much more work to do. So that turns me to where are the active areas of studies? I think you guys can glean that there are two sort of baskets, two principles. One is studying HPV-related cancers. They seem to be a different entity all in, and this, all in of this, themselves, which is true. And in the effort to intensify treatment during the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, we inadvertently included the HPV cancers because we didn't know it was a problem. 
And the thought right now of, among experts and leaders in the field is that we are over-treating these patients. And so active areas of studies are pursuing de-intensification of treatment by a variety of methods for this patient population. This is just one table showing the active studies, and it's dizzying, but it's good for patients that need to be treated. One such study that I was very active in was the NRG HN002. I personally put on between 10 and 15 patients to this study. It was low volume, HPV-related non-smoking, or low to non-smoking patients who were randomized to a dose-reduced radiational loan arm, just for reference, our normal dose, standard dose, is 70 gray, so a 5 to 10% reduction in the total dose, versus the re and this was altered fraction, versus standard lower dose radiation with chemotherapy. The results were literally published last month in the JCO, one of the leading cancer, probably the leading cancer journal um, out there, and largely the, the, the outcomes were equivalent between the arms, except it was a slightly higher risk for failure where the cancer started in the radiation alone arm. But as you can see, the survival rates are in the 90s, which is uh, comparative, comparable to that historically seen for this patient population. Between the two treatment arms, there was no difference in swallowing function, although there was a decrement in each arm of patients undergoing treatment. And as expected, the combination, the chemo radiation arm, had higher side effects than radiation alone. HN002 led into HN005, which is currently open and actively accruing. And again, is looking at that same HPV-related population, standard chemo radiation doses, testing it against perhaps de-escalated therapy. And we're hoping that one of these arms would, will win, prove to us that we can, in fact, safely de-escalate treatment, keeping the same cure rate, but reducing the side effects, sometimes long-lasting to the patient. The other principle are, uh, is dealing with the patient population that we're, we continue to have difficulty with the smoking-related patients who often undergo surgery up front and have high-risk pathologic features and need adjuvant treatment, uh, often with radiation plus some form of systemic therapy. And this is an intensification trial. How do we intensify treatment safely to bump up the cure rate for those patients that have this deadly disease? Switching gears yet again, where do I personally see the future of radiation oncology? Well, when I was a junior faculty at the University of Arizona just a few years ago, I thought about a curious question. We take daily images of our patients for setup, for setup accuracy, but the data goes into a repository and nobody really looks at it ever again. So I scoured the literature and said, hmm, could we use this data to predict who would do well and who wouldn't? It took a lot of searching, but I found one small paper of 15 patients of lung cancer patients where they looked at the daily cone beam imaging, tracked the reduction in tumor, uh, excuse me, the, the tumor reduction over the course of the chemo radiation, and they found, not surprisingly, a difference. Patients who responded, those who responded the best, did the best in the long run. Those who did not respond during treatment did so poorly. And so we did a study of our own because we couldn't find another replicated in the head and neck cancer world using our daily image guidance. And here's an example. A patient with a large right base of tongue tumor for an untrained eye, it may be difficult to see, but it is here because this is a non-contrast, non-diagnostic cone beam CT, but it's outlined here by a red X at the start of the chemo radiation. You can see midway the patient had a dramatic response to his treatment. There is a reduction in tumor bulk. You can see finally the epiglottis here. And at the end of treatment, there was actually a void of tissue where the tumor once was. So among 34 patients we retrospectively analyzed, we found a difference in patients 
and uh, with regards to how they responded during their chemo radiation. Not surprisingly, those never been published, patients who did well during the treatment, meaning their tumor regressed during the treatment, ended up having long-term local control. And we found the critical threshold to be 25%, meaning from the start to the end of the chemo and radiation treatment, if you can get your tumor down to less than 25% of its original volume, you had a very high chance for having durable local control and essentially cure. And this is shown here, where the survival differences between those patients who achieved that 25% threshold were remarkably different in how well they did. But that led me to another question. Sure, we can predict who does well and who doesn't, but where does that leave us? Well, currently it is very difficult to constantly replan patients. It's just the logistics, it takes probably 10 man hours to get one patient from simulation to the start of treatment. It's very arduous. But I thought perhaps if the technology continues to improve, maybe one day we can adapt while they're on the treatment table. And we have the technology that's emerging now, and I'm excited that we're going to have it here at our, at our cancer center. So what does it mean to adapt? Well, the dictionary says to make fit as for a specific or new use or situation, often by modification. This is what is meant by personalized medicine, by precision medicine. And we can take advantage of the differences in information that each type of imaging affords us. Here is the same patient. This is a CT with diagnostic CT with IV contrast. Here is a PET CT, which gives us metabolic information, active tissues show a bright orange overlaid onto the CT anatomy, and MRI, which gives us a plethora of information and incredible soft tissue delineation. But how can we bring that into the clinic for someone who's going active chemo radiation, um, and how do we implement that into perhaps adapting their treatment? Well, here's a patient of mine that had an unusual disease course. You can see here, this is a left base of tongue cancer. Primarily the nodes are left-sided, which is expected. And then he had a couple small right-sided lymph nodes. This was his initial simulation scan, which I planned off of here, outlined in red as my, uh, my um, planning target. However, the patient noted, as, as did I, that though the left-sided disease was was shrinking and the patient was now able to swallow better, the right-sided disease got bigger. And so we re the patient. It was unclear what was occurring and what we needed to do. We then got an MRI and the MRI gave us the answer. What was occurring, this is what's known as multi-parametric information, meaning the same MRI, you tweak it around a little bit, can give us differing information. What was happening here is this node was necrosing. The internal components was just dead debris and fluid. And it was by hydrostatic pressure pushing out on the remaining rim of tumor. Needless to say, we still had to change and adapt our plan, but we were thankful that it wasn't disease progression outright. So what comes next? Well, our medical oncology colleagues understand the need for improvements in biomarkers. And we have Oncotype DX for breast cancers. We have Foundation One to test different molecular changes. Uh, we can test the blood for circulating tumor cells and cell-free DNA, et cetera, et cetera. But in our field, some of us uh, are looking at radio biomarkers. What can we find that in many cases are invisible to the, to the human eye, but that sophisticated software can glean information from. Uh, differing MRI sequences, a field what is known, what's known as radiomics is emerging. And I think this will all come to cohesion. I'm, I'm hoping by the end of my career that we can unify both what's known as an MRI Linux, which we are going to have here open live in July of this year, uh, formally thought to be 
incomprehensibly um, doable uh, because, as I mentioned before, electrons need to be spun around at the speed of light. How do you put that around an MRI magnet that is of, you know, 0.3 Tesla, 1 Tesla, 2 Tesla? It once was thought to be unachievable, but it's been done. And it allows us now to see the patient, their tumor, their normal tissues in real time with MRI definition. And there's software embedded with this technology where we can adapt the treatment every day. Granted, at the moment, it takes about an hour, so it's not completely uh, efficient, but certainly beats the six, seven, ten hour method that we would have to do offline. Here is just a, a, a graphic demonstration of all the total MRI Linux available in the world. And we, Little Enlo uh, Regional Cancer Center, is going to be one among these. And in the United States, we'll be the first north of Los Angeles and only the third in Cal of all of California. And in fact, probably the first uh, community practice of this size to have acquired this technology. So it's, it's very, very exciting. And I'm glad that we can introduce this to our community. There's going to be a lot of growing pains because uh, this is, that is the case as always with new technologies. But um, I'm excited to be a part, to be a part of this. So with that, I'd, uh, hopefully I didn't lose too many of you, but uh, uh, that concludes my talk. I, I can take questions now. Thank you, Dr. Yi. That was incredible. I'm super excited to hear more about what you were just describing at the end there. Um, anybody have questions? You just have to unmute yourself and and ask. I think you covered everything, Dr. Ye. Hopefully, uh, I knew I wanted to be broad, um, but hopefully people didn't get too lost. If anybody has questions, feel free to email me or come to my office um, and we can chat. And if there's any questions, go ahead. I was just going to say, did anyone have any questions for Tracy or myself regarding any just more broad um, topics? All right. It might be good to do a virtual grand rounds in the future, Dr. Yi, on the very that very uh, last part that you were sharing so that folks have a better understanding of uh, what will be coming to the community. Yeah, yeah so what, I'm really, what I'm really hoping to do is, um, I, I think doing an introductory grand round is probably not enough meat necessarily to do that, but I'm hoping that we can create a clinical registry here, collect data, analyze our data, uh, either as an independent site or part of a consortium, they exist out there already, as you could probably imagine, it's a fairly small community, but it does exist. And then present, you know, what, what, like, what is it clinically, what is, what is this technology actually affording to the patient? Um, but certainly I can do a small little presentation, say, hey, this is the machine, this is what it's capable of. But I think it'd be most useful, particularly for other providers, primary care, physicians, et cetera, to say to be for us to be able to say, hey, you know, here are some preliminary data. Uh, yeah, sure, this is the technology, but what what people really want to know is how do patients actually do with your technology? How is the control of cancer? How are the side effects, etc.? And I'm I'm hoping, uh, hoping, hoping, uh, hoping that we can get uh, to that point. Excellent. Well, thank you everybody for joining today. We hope to see you again on May 5th um, and at the future uh, virtual grand rounds. Thank right. you. Thank and you, Christy. Welcome. And thank you for recording this. Yes. For future. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.